You can put it on your calendar, but write it in there, pencil, because uh, last time he was supposed to be here, he didn't get to come. But Brother Mike's supposed to be here next Sunday. So remember that in your prayers this week. Been talking about Hebrews, the 11th chapter. I'm going to try not to hold you but a few minutes this morning because of the weather situation. I don't know when or if it's, I hope it ain't, but yeah, it'll get bad, but we'll try to get you out of here. But I want to touch on something that blessed my soul, and it does every time that I go there and read it. And I believe it'll bless you this morning. And we've talked about it before, but we're going to talk about it again. I'm not going to review very much. If you're out there listening and you want, to, uh, you want to know more about what we're talking about, Hebrews 11th chapter, I'm going to touch on that this morning, but not a lot. I'm not, I don't plan on it anyway. I think the last time I said that, I spent about 30 minutes on what I wasn't going to spend any time on. But in Hebrews 11th chapter, we are learning how the elders obtained a good report. And we're learning how that the, the way that they obtained, obtained their good report is the only way that we today can obtain a good report in the eyes of God. The only way that we can be justified, sanctified, glorified, the only way we can be saved today is the same way that the elders were saved, the same way that the saints in the Old Testament were saved. I realize we talk about a dispensation of law and we talk about a dispensation of grace, but in reality it has always been God's grace that saved mankind. And it has always been man's faith in that grace Faith in the finished work to come, and we looked, we've looked at that over and over again, how in Hebrews 11th chapter, it teaches us that Abraham, the father of our faith, was justified not by his works, but by faith. Faith in what? Faith in the promise that had been promised. Faith in the sacrifice that was to come. And it's important today, and you've heard me say this probably in both of the sermons that we've done on this so far, how important this is, Brother Rodney. How that if you miss this, you miss it all. How that in life, and the Apostle Paul using the wording here, that the elders obtained a good report, we here at least in this country, in our culture, we can relate to that. Because like I told you, if you go to school and you study and you do hard work, you get a report card. And that report card is based on what you've done. It's based on your accomplishments. The, the tests that you've taken, the studying that you have done. Your report card is based on that in our job market today. People receive an evaluation. And Brother Sleece, that evaluation is done on your merit. It depends that Brother Sleece is a slacker and he's not a good worker and he shows up late every day and he doesn't care when he clocks in or whatever, what kind of work he does once he gets there. He's not going to get a good report from his supervisor. Matter of fact, he probably going to get fired, but he for sure ain't going to get no raise. Amen? But if you get a raise, it is supposed to be based upon your merit, the work that you have done. So the Apostle Paul using the wording here makes it easy for us to understand today that the elders obtained a good report not by what they did, but through faith. That we today will obtain a good report when we stand before God. It will not be of what because of what we have done, because of what we have accomplished. Regardless of how important good works are, and they are important, regardless of how living right is, and it is very important, it will not justify you in the sight of God. Keeping the law will not, never did, justify anyone in the sight of God. If so, there would have been no need for the temple. There would have been no need for the sacrifices. If all they needed was the written law, there would have been no need for the sacrifice, the blood, which was a type and a picture of the great sacrifice to come for the salvation of mankind. And the reason this is so important, because if you mess this up, the Bible says in Hebrews 9 and 27, it is appointed unto man once to die. But after this, the judgment. After what? After death. In this life, you may stand before a judge and you may be guilty. You might have messed up. You may have broken the law. You may be guilty of sin. No doubt about it, you're guilty. And in the judicial system, you may get probation. You may get a second chance. You may get community service. You will get none of that at the judgment seat of God. 
If we have missed this, if our faith has been misplaced, if we, have, if we do not have His righteousness instead of standing there in ours, and I don't want to, I don't want to hurt your self-esteem today, or maybe I do, but if you believe you're going to be able to stand before God and, and, and boast of your good works and your good deeds and the things that you have accomplished and believe that that's going to cause you to be justified in His sight, you are deadly wrong today. There's only one way to be justified. For the Old Testament saints, it was looking forth to the promise that would be fulfilled on the hill called Calvary when Jesus would die. Whenever they sacrificed those lambs. Me and Reese was talking about this this week. It was not, and I know that you read the instruction and the way the Lord wanted it and all of that, and, and I'm not taking anything away from that. But if you look at it through the eyes of faith, it wasn't the blood of that little lamb that is born here on earth. And even though that it had no disease and it had no spot, it was not perfect. Amen? But it was as perfect as man could use at the time. But it wasn't really so much the lamb and, and, and the blood there. And, and please, don't send me no emails. I'm not, I'm not taking away from God's Word. I'm just saying that if you really look at it through eyes of faith, you realize that it was in what that blood represented. It was in what that sacrifice represented. The Bible teaches us plainly that that sacrifice was not good enough to take away sin. That te the Bible teaches us plain enough that that was a substitute. That was not yeah. the perfect sacrifice. Mm. That was a picture and a type. The Bible calls it a shadow of things to come. Mm. Of the promise to come. Mm -hmm. So if you miss this, there will be no going back. No redos. No doing it over. When Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. By what? By faith. By faith the elders obtained a good report. So you can go back and you, listen, you can listen to the first two sermons and find out where we're coming from today. That Jesus stood and told the Jews there, I believe it was in the book of Matthew, in one of the Gospels, He said, your father Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. He saw my day. And the Jews scratched their heads and said, wait a minute, how in the world did Abraham see your day? You're not, you're not even 50 years old yet and you're saying that Abraham has saw you? He said, before Abraham was, I am. But his point was this. Abraham staggered not at the promises of God. By faith, Abraham saw that which was to come. By faith, Abraham put his faith in the Word of God that God had promised that there would be a seed, that God had promised that there would be a Messiah, that God had promised that there would be a redemption for all of mankind. Faith in what God was going to do. And with that in mind this morning, that's about all the foundation I'm going to give you. I want to go to Genesis, the third chapter. Genesis, the third chapter. And we're going to take a look. This will be the first example of a blood sacrifice given in the Word of God. And every time I read this account, I get something new out of it. And I've read it over and over and over. But every time I read it, I get something new out of it. I get something that I see something in a different light than I have before. We find mankind here, Adam and Eve, that God has created in His own image. Brother Rodney, this was, the, this was as perfect as man would ever get on planet earth other than Jesus Christ. It was as perfect a situation. You know, I've heard people say over the years, well, I'd live for God if it wasn't for this. I'd live for God if it wasn't for that. In other words, if circumstances were right, I could live for God. Well, we find two people here that were in the best of circumstances that could be laid out for anybody. God created them in His own image. He put them in a garden of God, a garden, a garden of paradise, amen? And He gave them instruction and he, they could eat of every tree of that garden and they could fellowship with God. There was only one thing they couldn't do and that was partake, to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So we see man, even in the best circumstance, messes up, Amen? No, even if the environment's just right and holy for you, Brother Sleeve, Brother Sleeve's still going to mess up somewhere. Mm -hmm. Amen? Brother Billy's still going to mess up somewhere. So that's where we find mankind. 
We find them in the book of Genesis, the third chapter. Now remember, they had had fellowship with God. God would come and He would walk with them in the cool of the day. They were in a perfect city. Now let's see what happens. Surely, if anybody could live right, these people would be able to live right. Surely, if anyone could boast of their goodness, these people could boast of their goodness. Amen? Well, let's see what happens. This is the first verse. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now the first thing I want you to notice here, that he questions, instead of his question that he, that he puts to Eve, instead of looking at it this way, and you'll, you'll be able to comprehend what I'm talking about, because this is the way we think a lot of times. Instead of saying, look, Eve, God has given you all of these trees. You can eat of all of these, but you can't eat of that one there. Instead of looking at it like that, the devil questions it in a way to make it sound like God is keeping something from you. Instead of looking at it that I've got all of this, but that one is set aside for God, I can't eat from that. He got Eve's mind on the fact that, well, why won't God let me have that one? Hello. Amen. Man's never satisfied. The eye of the flesh is never satisfied. God has given us people that will not give up their tithe. God has given you 90% of your income. 90% and 10% is all he asked for. Yet that 10% is too much for us to sacrifice. That one tree was too much for mankind to keep his hands off of. Amen. And that's the kind of view that the devil gives you. Instead of having you look at all that God has blessed you with, he has you look at what you don't have. Instead of having you look at what you do have, Brother Sleece, he tries to get you to look at what you don't have. Then you're not satisfied with what you do have. Then, you're not, then we are not thankful enough for what we do have because all we can think about is, well, I wanted that over there. Mm -hmm. Amen? That's what I wanted over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but look what God is giving. Yeah, but I wanted that over there. Yeah, but look at this. No, we're too busy looking at the thing, the thing that God said, don't touch that, but you can have all of it. He didn't say not touch it. Don't eat of that. Amen? They would twist the word here in a minute and it would say that God said don't touch it, but He said don't eat of that. You can eat of all the rest of this. Just don't eat of that one tree. And he got woman's mind thinking about that. And he'll get your mind thinking about that too. And he'll cause you not to be able to enjoy the blessings that God has blessed you with. Because all you do is sit around thinking about the things you don't have. Amen? He'll cause you to look right past all that you do have and make you think about what you don't. Hallelujah. So Eve's carrying on a conversation with the devil. That's a big mistake right there. Mm -hmm. You'll find whenever the devil came to Jesus in the wilderness, he didn't carry on a conversation with the devil. The devil tempted him. The devil tried to, to uh, get him to fall, tried to get him to sin. And the only thing Jesus would do was quote Scripture to him. That's what we were to do. Amen? Well, listen to this. And I'm trying to hurry. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it. Now here she adds something. I don't know if Adam had told her this. I don't know if she had came up with this in her own mind, but God never said this part. Whenever she said, Ye shall not eat of it, that was God's words. Neither shall ye touch it. That was not God's words. God did not say, Neither shall ye touch it. Amen. Lest ye die. And if you look up that word lest in the Hebrew, we've talked about this before, it means perhaps. It means peradventure. No, 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 no. God didn't say if God didn't say that the wages of sin might be death. God said the wages of sin is death. Amen. He didn't say Adam and Eve, if y'all eat of that one tree, that perhaps, maybe, peradventure, you could die. No, he said you fix it to die. If you partake, if you eat of that one tree. And they would. They would die spiritually, and then they would be restored by, through God. But most of the, the, the thing that affects us still today. They would die a natural death. They would die a natural death because up until that point, they wasn't going to die. But sin always brings death. Verse 4 says, And the serpent said unto her, Ye shall not surely die. Now see, he's saying, no, God's not right. His word's not right. He'll tell you that today. God's word's not right. He's, th that's not true. When you read that, that's not the truth. I can tell you what the truth is. The devil wouldn't know the truth if it bit him on the nose. Amen. 
For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when, the, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her, hus unto her husband with her, and he did eat. The Bible says in verse 7, And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. Now what do they immediately do? Soon as they messed up, and they realized, soon as sin consciousness came to, to be a reality in their mind, and they realized that they had sinned, and they realized that they had disobeyed the Word of God, what's the very first thing that man does? Man tries to cover it up with his own works. Man tries to cover it up with something that he has created himself. And the eyes of them both were open. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They made for themselves a covering to cover up that which they had done. Their nakedness, their sin, their shame. They begin to figure out a way for themselves to cover up or to fix the problem. You cannot fix your broken soul today by something that you do and you accomplish. You can only be fixed today by the blood of Calvary that flows from the old blood-stained cross. Isaiah 64 and 6 would say that our righteousness is as filthy rags. Amen? And that's exactly what these fig leaves would be for Adam and Eve. They would be filthy rags. They would not be sufficient. It was not enough for them that now we've messed up. We're naked. We see that now. Now, we're going to cover up our own nakedness. No, it would not be enough. They might have felt good for a little while. They might have thought, well, we fixed it. We've covered our nakedness. We're not naked now. We fixed the problem. How many times have we felt like we fixed the problem? But listen to this, and don't miss this. In verse 8, after they had fallen, after they had sinned, after they had made themselves fig leaves to cover up themselves. After they had tried to fix the problem themselves. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Like I told you last week, there are days that we have good days. And we may go to bed thinking, well... I really did good today. I did some good deeds. I did some good works. I didn't blow my top. I didn't lose my temper. I wasn't hateful with anyone. I lived good. And we may feel good about that. And that may make us feel holy. That may make us feel righteous. They may have felt holy. They may have felt fixed. Until the presence of God showed up. And when it did, Brother Sleeves, they realized just how feeble and how futile their efforts to cover up what they had done really was. You may feel good today about your self-righteousness. You may feel good today about your good works. You may feel good today about your good deeds. You may feel justified today because of the way you live and how holy you think you are. But trust me, my friend, when you stand, when we stand before the presence of an almighty God and we stand in His holiness and we view His righteousness, we will see then just how puny the things that we rely on for our holiness really is. Just how filthy those things really are. And Adam and Eve knew when they, when they heard God coming, when His presence began to come into the garden, they thought, oh no, that which we have done, we have sinned, we have rebelled, we have been disobedient, and the thing that we have done to cover it up is not good enough. The works of our hands are not good enough. And that's exactly how you're going to feel on Judgment Day. If you stand in His presence and you think you're going to rely on your own works and you think that you're going to rely on your own holiness and you think that you're going to rely on your own righteousness and you think that you're going to rely on the things that you have accomplished in this life if you really believe that those things are going to justify you when you stand in His presence, when you see His holiness, when we stand in the presence of an almighty, all-righteous, all-holy God, we will realize then it's not enough. We're not good enough. 
So if you trust in those things today, you will be let down. Listen to what the Bible says. Verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He didn't hide himself till God showed up. Amen. He probably felt pretty good about things until God showed up. Maybe he didn't feel great. But he had to at least be appeased a little bit at the fact that, well, at least we did cover ourselves up. Till God showed up. When God showed up, He ran and hid. Why? Because His self-righteousness, His self-help was not good enough. And God says in verse 11, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Now God is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. He knew what Adam and Eve had done. He wanted Adam and Eve to confess it to Him. Just like He wants you to confess your sins and He will be faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. He gives them an opportunity here to confess, to repent. And what do they do? They begin to blame each other. They begin to blame God. Verse 12 says, And the man said, The woman which whom thou gavest to me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Verse 13 says, And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. See, standing before God and blaming your brother or sister is not going to work. Standing before God and blaming your pastor is not going to work. Standing before God and blaming the, the denomination you're in or blaming the devil is not going to work. Yeah. Every one of these, they're confronted. It's time to confess. It's time to repent. And instead of doing that, you don't find them repenting. You do not find them repenting and asking God, Oh God, be merciful unto us. Forgive us. We rebel against your word. No. When he questions Adam, he said, It's the woman that you gave to me. Whenever he questions Eve, he says, It's the serpent that you made. Amen. That's what she's saying. It's the serpent that you made. So if they're not blaming God, they're blaming other people. If they're not blaming other people, they're blaming other things. And none of that would work. None of that would work. No repentance to be found here. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now listen to this. Verse 15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. Now there's the promise, the seed of the woman. And it shall bruise or break thy head, talking to the serpent, the powers of darkness, the devil, and thou shalt bruise his heel, speaking of the suffering of the cross that Jesus would suffer. The victory that Jesus would win on the cross of Calvary is that which he's speaking of here whenever he tells Eve, your seed, the seed of the woman, a virgin shall conceive. It will be the seed of a woman that will bruise the head, that will crush the head of the serpent, that will bring the fellowship that man and God once had will bring that back to the way it was in the beginning. That once again, it'll be even better. It'll be even better than it was in the beginning. But the only thing that could fix it, the only thing that could make it right, was that the seed come forth of a woman. And that that seed would be born in Bethlehem. And that that seed would die on the cross of Calvary. And that those that would put their faith in that, those that would put their faith in that say, Brother Billy, well, where's the sacrifice at that you were talking about? I'll tell you where it's at. Drop down a few verses. After the Lord gets through talking to the man and the woman and tells them what, how it's going to be, how you're going to have to plow and till the earth and how that you're going to be, have great sorrow and childbearing. Now what do we see? After God lets them know that their covering won't work after he addresses the sin and the things that had happened there, then he addresses the fact that they were trying to cover it, up, cover it up with their own hands. What do we see next? Verse 21. Drop down to verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Coats of skins. And in doing this, well, where did those skins come from? They came from animals. That's the first time that we will see the sacrifice in the Word of God that would point toward what? The seed that God had just spoke to Eve about that would bruise the head of the serpent. And now we see that God Himself 
kills the animals, sacrifices the animals, and takes those clothes and replaces the fig leaves that Adam and Eve had sewed together. God wants to replace today your old filthy rags with a garment of righteousness that can only be found by faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work. So He says the fig leaves aren't good enough. I'm going to make you some coats of skins. God was telling Adam and He was telling Eve that their fig leaves were insufficient. They were not good enough. He was also teaching them that without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sin. He was telling them that sin brings forth death and that there's only one remedy for that and that is a sacrifice. And that would be the seed of the woman that would bruise the head of the serpent. In this first sacrifice was laid the foundation of the entirety of the plan of God as it regards redemption. Also, it must be noticed here that it says God made. God provided. You're not going to make your own way for salvation. Oh, there's a, right that's, there's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is destruction and death. The only way that leads to life is the way that God has made. Your fig leaves ain't good enough, Brother Rodney. Your righteousness is not good enough. Amen? We must rely on the righteousness of God. And that's what we see here in the very, the very first instance of sin and rebellion that we see in the Word of God for mankind, there in the book of Genesis, they try to cover it up. God says that ain't good enough. There must be death. There must be shedding of blood. There must be a seed that comes forth that will bruise the head of the enemy that has caused mankind to fall. So we see all of this here in the book of Genesis. The third chapter. Salvation. The provision of God. And that's what He's made for you today. He's made provision for us. And if we put our faith in that, that's how we obtain righteousness. I'm going to give you these scriptures today. Romans 4. Romans 4, and beginning of the first verse, we're going to read three verses. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works... He hath whereof to glory, but not before God. He would be able to glory in his own means, in other words, if it was his own righteousness. But, but, but what does the Scripture say? Verse 3 says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So we see clearly in the Word of God how that we are justified today by faith, and that faith must be placed in nothing else than the finished work of Jesus Christ, because your finished work ain't good enough. You can live the entirety of your life and do nothing but good for mankind and still stand before God in shame because your righteousness is not good enough. It takes the righteousness of Christ that is imputed unto us when we put our faith in Him. By faith, the elders obtained a good report. By faith, Sleece Butler will gain a good report. By faith, Billy Douglas will gain a good report. By faith in Jesus Christ, if I, when I stand before God, I will be justified by faith in Jesus Christ and His shed blood. Not just on this side of the cross, but all throughout the Old Testament, we see time and time again from the sacrifices the altars that the men of God would build when they would have experiences with God, the sacrifices that would be made, all point to the promised seed that was coming and the finished work of the cross of Calvary. 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. Romans 1 and 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The just shall live by faith. Romans 3 and 24 says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 3 and 28 says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And like I said, now we're not talking about a lawless Christianity. Should we live right? Oh yeah. The Bible says we are saved unto good works. Meaning that once we are saved, we should live right, we should bring forth fruit. But it teaches us very clearly that living right cannot save you. Living right is a fruit, is, a, is, an, is an evidence, a lifestyle that comes from salvation. It doesn't bring you into salvation. It follows salvation. Living right 
doing right, following God's Word, all of that, important, important, yes, 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 but will not save you. You can keep every jot, every tittle, every letter, every law, every ordinance, every regulation, and still split hell wide open if you do not have your faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work, His blood. The Bible says in Romans 5 and 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 5 and 9, same chapter says, same book, says we are justified by His blood. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. Galatians 3 and 11 says that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, for the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3 and 24 says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we may just be that we may be justified by the keeping of the law. That's not what it says. That we may be justified by faith. Justification, sanctification, all comes by faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. When Paul was speaking to a group of people that were trying to work out their own salvation for themselves, trying to save themselves, go back into keeping, go into keeping the law and all of that, he told them that Christ has become of no effect to them. Because it says if they are justified by the law, if they try to get saved by the law, then they have fallen from grace. They have lost the object of their faith and they will die in their sin because of it. We look at sin as being... They commit adultery, they're drinking, they're cussing, they're, they're fornicating, they're killed somebody. The gravest sin that you can commit is to put your faith in something other than the shed blood of Jesus Christ because that will send your soul to a devil's hell. Last scripture, Galatians 2 and 16. We've read this one, I think, in all three sermons. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. I hope you see as clearly today in the picture of the fall of man in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve as I do, that man's efforts to cover up or to fix or to be righteous in their own right will always fall and always come short of what God demands. God demands righteousness to be brought to us only through faith in Jesus Christ. Justified, sanctified. And we will be glorified but only by the faith that we put in the cross of Calvary and His finished work and that's just one that in the Garden of Eden. If the Lord allows us to stay on the topic, we'll go on to other examples as well. But that's just one example. That's the first example of the sacrifice and the blood and the prophecy of the seed that would come and where our faith must be today. Someone else this morning have something before we go.